What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. Octavian and Anthony, the monsters post civil wars. Let's go. Yo Melkor, hope you're doing good. Following the battle of Mutina, the Roman Republic That should be it. It should be working now. Lepidus and Antony, facing a revived Pompeian faction, thanks largely to Cicero, had allied with one another. Octavian, having been used by the Senate to help fight Antony for them, mm -hmm. receiving little reward or recognition for his actions, has turned his back on the Senate. In this episode, we shall see how these three men would seize ultimate power. Power is in Rome. Both of the consuls for 43 BC, Panser and Hertius, had died, leaving the consulship vacant. And so who's going to take up the new positions? He had not been rewarded for his role in defeating Antony around Mutina, decided to act. In July, he sent an embassy of centurions to Rome, demanding the consulship and that the decree declaring Antony a public enemy to be rescinded. Okay. According to Appian, one centurion addressed the Senate with his hand on his sword and proclaimed, If you do not grant the consulship to Caesar, this will. The Senate refused, pointing out that Octavian was too young to legally hold the office. Octavian so how's he going to get around that? Counted, citing Pompey, Dolabella and other examples of underage consuls. Still, the Senate refused. Ah, so they're refusing even though that previous consoles have also been under the age of the requirement. In that case, aren't they just being hypocrites? Surely they're just being absolute hypocrites. Octavian's men demanded that he march on Rome to claim the consulship. This is but he's going to have a calmer mind, right? ...of how symbiotic the relationship between a general and his men was in the Roman Republic. Yeah, his men were loyal and loved him and only him. The soldiers gave the general power, which in turn led to political power, while a mm -hmm. general's political power was tied directly to how effectively and luxuriously he would be able to reward his soldiers. Octavian's men demanding he march on Rome should not therefore be seen as an act of political idealism, but more motivated by the knowledge that if their general was made consul, they would they get more work. I see. Rewards. Okay, maybe I was wrong then. gladly accepted their petition, marching eight legions across the Rubicon toward Rome. Caught between the Senate and Antony, it was now clear that Octavian had made his choice of which side he would join. History was repeating itself with yet another Caesar, which was now Octavian's legal name, okay. on Rome. Nice. The panic Senate sent messengers to Octavian saying that he would be granted full command of the army and the right to run for the consulship. However, almost immediately, the senators became ashamed for caving in to blackmail. Two legions that had been sent from Africa to assist in the war against Antony had just arrived in the city. And there was still one... They got a bit of reinforcement and then their balls grow a little bit bigger, don't they? They just feel like they can handle this. ...to protect the city. Cicero rallied the Senate, revoking the previous offer to Octavian. The legions were prepared to defend Rome and the city was fortified. Octavian's negotiation with the Senate's ambassadors was interrupted by a second delegation rescinding the offer. Immediately, he marched his force to Rome encamping on the campus Martius. Seeing the vast force assembled against them, yeah, what? two of the three legions in Rome lost heart, defecting to him. The senator I was about to say, like, he's got eight legions on his side. Like, that's a large, large force. Do they really think they can hold Rome? This had been brave to try and organize a defense of the city, but the popularity and power of Octavian was simply too great. Shortly after this, rumours circulated that two of Octavian's legions had defected, and some senators once again tried to raise legions to confront him. However, the rumours were no... false. Yeah. Oh, okay. Case, Octavian himself had been the source of the rumour, seeking to establish who his main opponents in the city were. All of them would be proscribed. Elections for the consulship were held, 
and to nobody's surprise, Octavian was elected alongside okay. Pius, Caesar's legate, who funded his young heir during the early struggle with Antony. Octavian immediately set about holding trials for those linked to the conspiracy against Caesar, including some men who had not even been in the city at the time. Or so was that him just trying to weed out all of his opposition opposition at the same time like most rulers do uh like you're saying this the senate was foolish to oppose the combined forces of octavian antony and lepidus who commanded dozens of legions at this point i also agree like it was a bit it was a bit silly in it were unanimously found guilty in the courts presided over by Octavian. Mm. One praetor who voted for acquittal would later be proscribed by Octavian. Another was rumoured to be plotting to assassinate Octavian and was sent on a ship to be exiled in Africa. The ship never arrived though, disappearing en route. This was just... So he just had him killed. Uh, he had him killed. Was it proven that the plot was him and that he was the uh, source of that plot to try and kill Octavian? Octavian was really set on avenging his adoptive father by putting the conspirators on trial. I agree, but if he, if this, the person that they would, I was just talking about a moment ago, was uh, not even in the country at that point in time. So. Was that him, Octavian, just sort of trying to um, take advantage of the situation at the same point? It was good that he was trying to avenge uh, Caesar, but I'm not too sure if that was the case. Then all the better. Yeah, I agree. It's, it was him sort of taking advantage of the situation then, like, I see. The taste of what was to come. Octavian would not show mercy to his mm. enemies. So Meanwhile, not like Caesar. Of That's where he differed. Lepidus, Plancus, Pollio, and Ventidius had combined west of the Alps in Narbonese Gaul, a huge force of 17 legions, with Antony and Lepidus in joint command. Octavian knew that to confront Brutus and Cassius and the immense force that they could amass in the east, he would need the help of these legions. As such, he rescinded the decree that made Antony an enemy of the state and sent letters of friendship to the two men, who both responded in kind. Between the three of them, they held the most powerful army yeah, west that's a of the lot Adriatic, of men. and each knew that they could benefit from cooperation rather than wasting their men fighting one another. Together, Smart once they marched again. on Decimus's position in North Italy. Decimus's legionaries, seeing the writing on the wall, began to abandon him in droves many turning to either Antony or Octavian. Which you expect. In desperation, Decimus attempted to flee to Macedonia with just his bodyguard, taking a long route through barbarian lands to the north, disguising himself as a Gaul to avoid detection. A Gallic chieftain loyal to Antony captured him in September, however, and Decimus was beheaded. It was a severe blow. Peak. He didn't even get ransomed, had no chance to save his life. That was it. He was just executed. Octavian learned the hard lesson from Caesar's assassination that mercy was clearly not an effective strategy in order to maintain power. It's a shame that you say that, like, because obviously you look at Caesar and that's what sort of uh, you, you would come to... Uh, the conclusion yourself for so i do see why octavian sort of done it but my main the main thing that drew me towards caesar was the fact that he was so forgiving so it's interesting to see octavian uh, and how he's sort of acting in this situation the differences the pompeian faction but it's understandable been one of caesar's most talented subordinates and was one of the best generals on the pompeian side with his death, the Italian peninsula was now effectively in control of the Caesareans. Mm. In Italy, in October 43, Antony, Lepidus and Octavian met on a small island in the Lavinius River, with five legions apiece lining the riverbanks. On that small island, they held one of the most important meetings in human history. Ooh. It was agreed that Octavian would resign his consulship, Ventidius taking his place. Instead, three new magistrate positions with almost limitless powers would be created. The trio would hold these offices together for an initial five years. So this is another like triumphant then. 
Is that what we're sort of uh, going into here? Why are they making these three brand new positions up? Like, isn't it just going to make problems later further down the line within the Roman Empire? Could make and annul laws without approval from the Senate or people, and would name the other magistrates for the next five years, and their decisions would be immune from veto. Mm. The three men each effectively would hold the same powers as Caesar had. The provinces west of the Adriatic were also to be divided amongst the three, Antony having control over Transalpine and Cisalpine Gaul, yeah. Lepidus all of Hispania and Narbonese Gaul, and Octavian Africa, Sardinia, Sicily and surrounding islands. Okay. It's clear from this division that Octavian was the junior partner. Mm, Gaul and Hispania the, were two of the most... He's getting the least amount of land, but isn't that some of the most um, prosperous er uh, within the area? I'm not too sure. ...thought after provinces, the former for its potential for expansion, the latter for its rich silver mines. Octavian's territory, on the other hand, had little to offer. Oh, literally Moreover, did. Sicily was contested by Sextus Pompey, and a strong Pompeian presence persisted in Africa. So he didn't even have control of the Egypt, uh, Egyptian area. It was just sort of the northern coast of Africa uh, Octavian had access to. So he didn't even have the resources of Af uh, Egypt, I'm assuming. Yeah, the problem with North Africa is that it didn't come with a lot of the legions either. I see, okay. Although he carried a powerful name through his adopted father, Octavian was still not as powerful as his fellow triumvirs. Military plans were also laid down. Lepidus would remain in Rome with three legions, while Antony and Octavian would lead the main force to Greece to confront Brutus and Cassius. More darkly... I, I am assuming if I was Octavian, I'm happy there. I don't want to be Antony and staying in Rome. I want to be with the legions making... Uh, taking the fight to the opposition. That way I can make uh, more of a name myself and get more... Um, yeah, just more glory and more ability to swing that power in my favour. They also planned the proscriptions list, an idea made infamous by the dictator Sulla. A prescription list was a collection of names that was posted publicly. Any man whose name was on the list immediately had their property declared confiscated by the state and was condemned to death. Effectively, state-approved murders. During the Whoa. last series of prescriptions under Sulla in 83 BC, a young Julius Caesar had been forced into hiding and may well have been prescribed himself. It was partly for this reason that Caesar had refused to carry out similar purges during his dictatorship. Yet yeah, Octavian's going to do the same thing. That's crazy. That list is absolutely crazy and breaks my mind. Like, how unfortunate is it that you you just have to go on the run just because you have a, a slight opposition a slight different opinion to the, to these people Antony Lepidus and Octavian were of a different generation however the oldest of them Lepidus had been just six years old during mm. Sulla's reign and the prescriptions had left a much less marked effect on them together they wrote up the lists targeting mainly those with political power but also personal enemies and those who were rich and whose confiscated property could thus be used to fuel the war effort. Octavian was a part of that. Were not safe. Antony's uncle Lucius was added to the list, as was Lepidus's brother. Cicero, the one-time mentor and ally of Octavian, was also proscribed, though Octavian did apparently try to argue against this for two days before relenting. I bet you it was something along the lines of one of their family members went on the list and they were just like, well, if one or someone close to them went on the list, so they all had to have someone close to them on the list. Imagine it. Imagine it. I couldn't make that type of decision, could you? That's disgusting. It is important to note here that Cassius Dio and Paticulus claim that Octavian only took part because he held similar authority that he was effectively unwilling, showing himself later to be a merciful man, and that he tried to save many from the prescriptions. How much of that is actually true? 
or is, is my question because at the that was putting me off of Octavian. But if he regretted the decision later and tried to save himself, that would make me appreciate him a bit more. But at the same time, I just don't know how much of that is true. Do you know what I mean? Um, is it because of his name afterwards that people are trying to say that now? What actually happened at that point in time? I think is a good question to ask. However, other sources, such as Appian and Plutarch, do not say this. In their accounts, all three men were equally there you culpable. Go. Dio is well known as being overly flattering to Octavian mm. as a result of his position as a senator in the empire and thus having a vested interest in having a sympathetic view of the emperor. Paticulus has similar problems, serving during Octavian's reign as emperor under Octavian's grandson and thus having a personal investment in glorifying him. Yeah, it's not looking good for Octavian. I, at the moment, I'd need to look into the situation more, but I'm sort of uh, sitting on the fence that he was sort of more involved. That's where I'm sort of sitting at the moment, but I definitely need to look into it more. Their views have proved <coughs> consistent. But the yeah, I agree. Well I agree, Rudy. Apologist revisionism and Appian and Plutarch do not offer the same excuses, both putting Octavian on the same level as Antony and Lepidus. Mm. Indeed, Appian says that the terrors that would be inflicted on Rome during this time were all the more remarkable precisely because of Octavian's participation, and Plutarch described the trio as having made a barter of murder for murder. Mm. Within just three days, the three men had planned how to take full control of the Senate, planned a war against the Liberators, and had planned the deaths of 300 Senators, about a third of the Senate, and 2,000 knights. <sighs> Crazy numbers. Crazy numbers. So quick as well. And they just, they, they had a plan, they put it into effect. Where it shows you when they're actually on the same play, page how much can be achieved. Unofficially, the second triumvirate had just there been formed. After the negotiations, the three began to march on Rome. For now, the majority of the prescriptions were put on hold, but there were 17 men who needed to be targeted early, among them Cicero and Salvius, a tribune of the plebs. Cicero, who held the sympathy of the public, managed to elude his hunters, while Salvius okay. was not so lucky. He was found hosting a banquet when soldiers burst in, ordering the guests to remain in their positions and beheaded the tribune leaving his guests reclining in shock next to his beheaded corpse. Ah, could you imagine? You can't do anything, otherwise you're going to end up in the exact same position. That would follow you for the rest of your life. The people back in those days just, they couldn't have a concept of, like, I don't know how to explain it. Hmm. How would I explain it? That's really interesting. Like, 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 like things happen. So, so many horrific things happen that they get numb to it. So they don't actually have time to sort of sit and dwell on what's happened. They sort of just continue through life and deal with, deal with that and not really think about it because they got to focus on surviving to the next day. Whereas now we would sit and be able to think about it because we haven't got to worry about that the next day. That's what I sort of mean, do you know what I mean? Like, I'd imagine they didn't have time to deal with it as much. Yeah. Yeah, if you get what I'm sort of saying. Panic gripped the city shortly afterwards, and Pedius, one of the consuls of the year, publicised the names of the 17 men the Triumvirs were hunting, mm. attempting to reassure the public that only those 17 were listed. Pedius died the following day, reportedly of, quote, political fatigue, unquote. But it is not hard to think that he was murdered for having revealed the 17 names. Cicero, having tried to escape Italy by sea, had grown sick and was forced to make land. He was oh, soon really? found near his villa in Formier, so he carried didn't. in a litter. His slaves and other locals had lied about his location to protect him, but he had finally been betrayed by a local shoemaker. A centurion, who Cicero had previously defended, found the now 63-year-old orator. He accepted his death, offering his neck 
and was executed. Mm. Cicero just offered his neck. He knew what was happening. He couldn't stop it. And from a person that he had defended previously in life, like had been the voice of shame. the public. Whether one agrees or disagrees with his actions or politics, he was a brave man who, when surrounded by swords, tried to defend his republic with a pen. He was a brave man. He was a brave man. He took from Marcus Cicero a few anxious days, a few senile years, mm. a life which would have been more wretched under your dominion than was his death in your triumvirate. But you did not rob him of his fame, the glory of his deeds and words. Nay, you but enhanced them. He lives and will continue to live in the memory of the ages, and so long as the universe shall endure, this universe, which he saw with eye of his mind, grasped with his intellect, and illuminated with his eloquence, shall be accompanied by the fame of Cicero. His head and his hands, with which he'd written such damning speeches against Antony, were nailed to the rostra where he had given so many speeches. The triumvirs entered Rome over three days. So not only did they behead him, they took his hands as sort of trophies. That's disgusting. That poor man's body was absolutely um, defiled. That's so unfair. So unfair. The concept uh, was set many decades earlier by Sulla. And with any president... President, it's very hard to put that back into the bottle. I also agree, like, they were more exposed to deaths, but I think they were still traumatised. I do think they were traumatised, but they weren't able to dwell on those traumatic events as much as someone would be able to, or would today. Do you know what I mean, DZ? They would still be traumatised, and they would still have those effects, and have to deal with them, but I don't think that those effects would appear as often as someone who wasn't as occupied. Because we all know if you're occupied and you've got to do things that your mind's not um, as focused on the bad, because you've got to do something. So because we are able to do nothing and think about the bad so often, we would think about those trauma events more so i definitely think that they would still be affected but i just don't think that they would be able to it would uh, appear as often each bringing a bodyguard and legion completely disregarding the law prohibiting arms in the city a head breaking the all the rules Didius proposed the law that would give extraordinary powers to antony lepidus and octavian with their legions and bodyguard prowling the city, the bill was swiftly passed. The well, of course it was. It was now legally established. Overnight, lists appeared in the forum with the names of the condemned. A reward was also offered, 2,500 denarii for each head of a prescribed man brought mm. to the triumphians. Rewards were also offered for information on a wanted man's location while any person harboring a fugitive would also be added to the list. Oh. The gates of Rome were blocked by soldiers and the proscription... That's it. You have no luck. You have no luck. Most of the people that you trusted now can't be trusted. That's it. ...this began in earnest. Appian's account of the proscriptions is harrowing. Men hid I bet it was a slaughter. Wells, ...chimneys, ovens, wherever they could before being discovered, dragged out, and executed by their hunters. Mm. One man even hid himself in a dung heap. The soldiers, disgusted and unwilling to reach in for him, simply stabbed the heap with spears until he emerged, then promptly beheaded him. Oh, holding on to one another were executed oh that's disgusting. Imagine just... I don't know if that's true, but imagine being that desperate that you're just willing to hide in shit. A sword. Shockingly, even children were not safe. Mm. Orphans whose parents had left them with large amounts of money were also added to the list. One was found. Nah, nah, fam. Nah, fam. That's just scummy. Cause that's just scummy. That's scummy. Had left them with large amounts of money were also added to the list. 
One was found at his school with his tutor. When the hunters burst into his classroom, the tutor tried to shield the young boy with his body, but both were cut down mm. without mercy. That fucking tutor, that tutor was a better man than anyone else. Night after night, the prescription lists were expanded, so none truly knew if they were safe or not. Mm. Gangs roamed the city, looking for any of the prescribed, and any opportunity to loot abandoned houses. Fear was rampant. Wives, siblings, and friends informed on their loved ones, and no one was sure who could be trusted. That's it. Even some That's children, it. eager for their inheritance, reported on their fathers. You literally had families backstabbing, uh, backstabbing, backstabbing, and turning on each other. You literally was just destroying families and tearing them apart. Oh my god, what was the after effects of this? I'm looking forward to finding out. I'd imagine the after effects of this was crazy. With so many being killed, many seized the opportunity to settle old scores, murdering their rivals under the pretense that they had been proscribed. Many simply gave in, either handing themselves over in order to try and protect their families, or simply waiting for death. Mm. Others decided to take fate into their own hands, jumping off rooftops or bridges. To commit suicide. A year old senator opened the doors of his house to the public and invited them to take anything they wanted. Once his property had been stripped, he burnt it with himself inside. Knowing that he was going to die and not wanting the Senate or anyone of the triumphant to have those things. Many wives also killed themselves over the bodies of their husbands, mm. entire families being eradicated. Among these horrors, there were also acts of extraordinary bravery. A senator named Capito, for example, fought in the narrow passage of his doorway, cutting down a number of his hunters before being overwhelmed and... Nice! Sons faked the deaths of their fathers and then smuggled them out, one carrying his elderly father on his shoulders. Nice, nice. I hope they got away. I hope they got all the. I just hope they fully got out. I really, really do. Yo, Jay. I hope you're doing good. Yeah, it's it's an absolute purge. Upon hearing that soldiers were coming for his master, swapped outfits with his master and took his place in his bed. The soldiers arrived and killed the slave where he lay. The senator dressed as a slave, standing nearby. Antony's. Did the save choose to do that? His were coming for his master. Swapped outfits. Ah, so the 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 slave knew he was going to die. That was a brave man again. Place in his bed. The soldiers arrived and killed the slave where he lay. The senator dressed as a slave, standing nearby. Antony's mother, Julia, was outraged that her brother Lucius had been added to the mm. list and confronted Antony, defiantly declaring that she would protect her brother and that he would have to kill her too if he wanted his uncle dead. Antony relented, Lucius's life being saved. When the nice. Tragedians announced an unheard nice. before tax upon women, Hortensia, the daughter of a famous lawyer, rallied the women and confronted the Triumvirs. She insisted that if Rome were fighting a foreign power, the women would gladly support the state. But in civil wars, may we never contribute, nor ever assist you against each other. Okay, that's kind of fair. That's kind of fair. Did it work? Because that's smart, that's smart. You're having a civil war, you fight between yourselves. No, you don't need nothing from us, but yeah, yeah, I like that. That's a smart play. That's a smart play. Given the current political climate, it was an incredibly brave act. The Triumvirs needed money, and the confiscation of prescribed property was intended to solve this. Through such grisly methods, the Triumvirs accumulated huge amounts of property, but they struggled to sell them. Many of the richest men were now dead, and many were terrified to bid on the properties, mm. lest they also be seen as having money and being added to the lists. Thanks to Hortensia, the tax on women was only enforced upon 400 of Rome's richest forcing the Triumvirs to compensate by forcing male property owners to lend money to the state. Okay. Some men did escape the... So it didn't work out as well as they thought, so it was... 
prescriptions. Okay. Many flocking to the banners of Sextus Pompey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Octavian is definitely a mama's boy, Rudy. Sicily, or Brutus and Cassius in the east. Sextus even went so far as to offer his own rewards for those that helped prescribed men escape to him. As a result, Sextus, whose situation so far had been rather weak, had an influx of powerful mm. men into his faction, including many who had seen military service, greatly strengthening his position. With many of the most powerful men in Rome either dead or having fled the country, and Oh, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that. How many of the people on the list were the commanders of their armies? Or, or just in general? How like how many of the senators or the leaders that people on the list were people that they would have used? Didn't it, or they could, or like the people that they could have rallied to their arms as well. Octavian were left in complete command of Rome. The prescriptions, which began in November of 43 BC, continued for months into 42 BC and cemented the Second Triumvirate as the masters of Rome. The it it continued on for months. Consisting of Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar, had wielded power through the influence of the three men. Mm. It had been founded upon a base of mutual opportunism, had been largely bloodless, and while the three men unofficially ruled Rome, kept at least the facade of the republican constitution. Even the dictatorship of Caesar had relied far more on the political alliances and debts created by Caesar than terror. Yeah, this one was crazy. Was different. It was ratified by law, effectively making Lepidus, Antony and Octavian simultaneous dictators in all but name. And I see, I see. The last one was sort of more uh, because each one of them had power, there was an equal balance. Whereas this one was sort of put on paper that they were all the dictators. It was founded upon fear and death. The mm. purges were appalling for people at the time. By these means, the Caesarian party had seized control of Rome. In the east, however, Brutus and Cassius had been raising a colossal army and consolidating their position. Are the public also going to like Brutus and that more because because of what the Caesarians have just done with the list? History once again was about to repeat itself, with the Caesarian and Pompeian parties again fighting a battle to decide Rome's fate in Greece. We will talk about this battle in our next episode. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to finding out what happens in the next episode. That's going to be a good one. Battle in Greece. That's where we're going in our next Roman reaction. I'm looking forward to it. What's like got here?